He's been with uh, Palm Beach County ERM since 1990 and has managed numerous wetland projects within Lake Worth Lagoon. And he's going to give us uh, an update on the uh, Snook Islands project. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the Snook Islands project. Uh, it was completed in 2005. And I also want to talk about, uh, if you look in the background of this slide by the bridge, you'll see a boardwalk and fishing pier. I'll be talking a little bit about the construction of the public use facilities there last year. And also about the Snook Islands Page Beach project in Bryant Park that are going on uh, just to the north of that, that Negrove Island. Uh, the private partners on uh, Snook Islands were in Palm Beach County, the city of Lake Worth, and find the Corps of Engineers, Port of Palm Beach, and the West Palm Beach Fishing Club. And everyone uh, either donated land or time or money uh, to make this project happen. The goals of the project were to uh, repair uh, the eroding shoreline at the golf course is one of the reasons why we did this, uh, to try to get the city on board. Uh, when they dredged the, uh, the bottom of the lake for, to create the golf course, you can see that they had put in a shoreline in 1925, and, but that shoreline, is, the, the seawall has failed, and we were trying to put, replace the seawall and the shoreline armor that the city was putting in with a native vegetation. This, the golf course was created, as I said, in 1925. It's 100 acres, uh, and it has 1.2 miles of shoreline. And uh, if you think Julie had mud problems, this one's got even more, uh, which you'll see as we go on. This is a picture of the golf course after it was originally dredged and created. And this is the Fimitry pre-construction. And you can see on, the, uh, on your left side of the screen, those are the natural elevations that range from about two to five feet. Then you have the intercoastal channel down the center. And on the right side of the screen, you'll see the dredged area where the bottom was just gouged to create the fill for the golf course. And if you'll notice, at the north end, this trench right here, this is where the new Snook Islands 2 is going in. And you can see it's one of the worst spots in the entire shoreline. Okay, this is just another picture of the, the seawall that fell in. It's got such a deep hole right up to the shoreline. It sloughs in, and you get mangroves growing behind the wall. So we pulled those walls out and tried to maintain the, uh, the mangroves on the shore. And you can see this is some of the riprap that they're having to put in to try to keep the golf course from falling into the lake. This is our plan. Uh, you can see the mangrove islands on, on the top of the slide, four of them going across. Then we also have the planters along the shoreline and the yellow lines along the golf course shoreline where we were planting Spartina. And the reason we designed it this way was to try to give some protection for wave energy using the offshore islands so that the seagrasses would have a better chance of recruiting on the back side of the island. And again, on the right, uh, let's see, that, never mind. Painted Island is a source of fill for Snook Islands. It's an 87 acre island created from the basin and intercoastal dredging. First thing we had to do was take the, the uh, vegetation off the top. And after, after the vegetation was removed, it was chipped. A lot of it was used in the park areas on uh, Peanut Island. And the remainder of it was burned in an air curtain incinerator. Once the vegetation was removed, they started removing the fill from the island. Uh, we used 1.2 million cubic yards of fill that was transported down to the product site, and this is kind of what Kingdom Island looked at like when we were done. You notice that the big uh, spoil containment area at the north look at the top of your slide is where uh, fines can be used for its maintenance dredging in the future, and I think they have like about a 50-year uh, maintenance window for that. We also used the fill that was dug, uh, dug out for the snorkel lagoon at the southeast or corner of the island and also for the uh, boat basin on the west side of the island. The fill was uh, put onto a conveyor system into a surge pile and that conveyor went out to a barge and the barge was winched back and forth to be loaded efficiently with, with fill off the island. And it was transported down 10 miles to the Lake Worth uh, project. They had to go through three bridges. We had about, uh, about uh, 5,160 barge loads went through there. 
When it got to the other site, uh, this is the uh, offloading system. You can see the, the uh, fill barn is at the bottom. And uh, it, it, the uh, excavator would pull off the fill barge, put it into a hopper. And this is a big conveyor system. And you, you'll notice the difference between this when we get to the, to the end of the uh, presentation when we talk about it. It's phase two. It's a difference in scale. This was a $30 million project. The Snook 2 is $4 million, so the equipment and efficiency goes down on scale. The barge is pulled up to the excavator. The excavator has a bucket on it that can fill a dump truck with one scoop. Again, we had problems with mud. Uh, this was a deep hole. It averaged 10 to 15 feet, but there was a probably 20 feet of mud uh, or more. Uh, some, uh, one of the spuds that the barge was putting down was 50 feet and it went almost down to the surface of the water, 14 feet of water, so you can see that there's a lot, of, a lot of mud down at the bottom. The grading was done using a GPS system. You can see that the machines all have, are equipped with GPS that have both horizontal and vertical control. And you also see that uh, he stuck that excavator down in the mud and it's at least 15 feet right there that he went down. It was all controlled, as I said, with, with uh, computer systems and grading, and the, and the operator simply had to watch his little screen, and he knew wherever he was, what line he was cutting. In order to deal with the mud problem, uh, we, the contractor came up with this method, which was to essentially create a berm that gets moved out over time. And, and what you have here is on the east side, the right side of the berm are, is the mud hole, and on the west side is the finished grade. And this way, he kept the muds all pushed out in front of the berm and out from the project as he's building it. This is another shot doing the same thing, and you'll notice that right in front of the, uh, the south lobe there, you'll see the mud on the east side of the berm. There's a whole lot of it right there, but as you look farther to the north, to the top of the slide, the mud kind of dissipates. This is the hole that we're having to deal with right now. Once the fill was put in, we had to make the new shoreline with the old shoreline. This is a, uh, you can see the, where these mangroves are is where the seawall had failed. And we pulled all the old rubble out and put the new shoreline into the old shoreline and created a very gradual slope for the intertidal productivity. 28,000 tons of riprap was brought in to create the uh, mangrove islands, uh, to protect the uh, mangrove islands and also to create oyster reefs. And this is the oyster reef, it's a little lower than the wave break, and again you'll see the mud to the right of the screen. Once we got the shoreline, it was planted with 30,000 uh, spartine plants by the contractor, but we also had 80,000 mangroves that were planted through volunteer events on the islands. This is a before and after uh, two years from planting. In this, this uh, slide, you'll see the seawall on this is still intact, but it hasn't fallen in yet. So you can see through the trees to the, to the homes on the other side. And as Eric and Julie both talked about, the homeowners along the golf course were the most vociferous against this project, you know, saying that we were going to block their view. We were allowing them to trim the mangoes, but what we did is we filled over the top of that seawall. So on the bottom slide, you see a gradual slope of sand. That seawall is still there. We just came right over the top of the wall. So here you got a 2005 and 2006, and I'm going to go through a series of slides here showing you the progression on this particular stretch of shoreline. You notice the difference in the Spartina. Spartina is on, its, on the edge of its uh, range down here, and it has a tendency to come and go with different years, so you'll see it come and go at times. And the mangroves are coming. And now they're there, and you, the Spartina is beginning to be outcompeted, and it's pretty much gone along that stretch of shore because the mangroves have shaded it out. This is the other side of the mangroves. These, that's this the uh, intercoastal side, that's the golf course side. And now, we're getting complaints. <laughs> <laughs> when I originally envisioned this project, it was the top, the top slide is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see the, 
It's part time to give the people, we already had 10 acres and eight of mangroves that they'd given us to, to work on city property. I wanted to use the uh, Spartina because it's good habitat and also doesn't block the view, so I wanted to maintain that. And I fought tooth and nail through several administrations and it, it all, I was, I was denied at every point. I wanted to pull the mangroves out of there as they showed their heads to maintain that Spartina shoreline. Unfortunately, now the city is saddled with having to trim their mangroves to six feet and for, to the city, I apologize. You can see a nice Spartina band at the top of the screen here, which of course is gone now. This is a 2005 photo. And now I'm just going to show you a few of the photos from last year. This is a view from the water of the North Island. And you can see the mangroves are doing very well. I'd like to talk a little bit about the seagrasses now. This is uh, the original survey that we did right, right after the project was done in 2006 and 2007. We used GPS to try to, to map every single bed that showed up because it was one to begin with and we kind of wanted to see the progression. And you can see the yellow is 2006, the green is 2007. And as the years progressed, we, we couldn't, it, it pretty much coalesced and we were no longer able to tell individual clumps. So we went to a uh, transect quadrat system using a quarter square meter. This is a 2010 uh, survey, and we had an average, co uh, uh, an overall coverage of 87%, with an average density of approximately 30%. And of course, 90% of that was Halafel and Johnson I. So the seagrasses came in and done really well, pretty much covered all the area that we targeted uh, at the seagrass elevation. Going through some of the wildlife that's shown up just to give you an idea of the shorebirds who really love it there. Uh, this is a, a piping plover that's banded. Uh, we have two that have been sighted at Snook Islands now. Uh, looking at the bands, we were able to tell that they uh, were hatched on the Platte River in Michigan. And these are my birds, the oyster catchers. They showed up in 2005 as soon as we finished the project. And a contractor, he said, you know, I think there's birds nesting out there. And I'm like, what do you mean? I go out there and sure enough, there they are on top of the riprap. They're nesting. Um, these birds have nested every year since, since 2005. They produced six chicks so far, fledged. And they had uh, three, different, three different nest sites. First on top of the mangrove, then on the beach and now uh, back to the planet, the juvenile. This is uh, taken two weeks ago. This is the original pair uh, on their nest site that they've chosen now. It's on top of sort of some rubble against the mango riprap. And this is our new pair that showed up last year. Uh, our second pair of birds are now nesting. Uh, on one of the mango rip wraps, and it's interesting because the birds used to, every time another pair or group of oyster catfish come in, the original pair would squabble with them and they'd fight, and eventually they'd go away. But these two now are nesting within sight of the other birds, and we kind of wonder whether or not it might be one of the chicks that they had originally in the last six years coming back home. This is uh, some pictures of fish that have been caught in the Snook Island. You see the clubhouse in the background. Um, Mark, manatees like the Julie was saying, we'll come, they like the Spartina. There's not a whole lot of good seagrass, so they're in there eating the Spartina. And fitter clabs, these guys just went gangbusters. And you can see the whole shoreline is basically just called the fitter crabs, which are an excellent soup food source for all the birds and the fish. So we have a 2005 and our 2013 pictures. This is from the bridge. So that's sort of what's happened with Snook Islands. So let's move on to the public use facility, which I forgot to put a nice plant view in there. So you'll see how it works out. Uh, we put in a fishing pier along the Lake Worth uh, Bridge, pretty much just to the side of, of the old bridge that you see here, and then a boardwalk around the, the uh, mangrove planter. 
the uh, cut cut the uh, bridge into pieces, pull them up, put them on the barge, then pulled the pod caps, and we took them offshore and put them in the hole. We thought it was a great idea. We'd be able to prep the bottom for for the next phase. We also put the Lantana Bridge in there. The demolition of the bridge went in the hole. Then we pulled the piles. Then we had to do the seawall. Put the piles in, the framing, the inspections, decking, floating docks, fix the road, Put in the curbing, drainage, and we had volunteers put in these plants. So the final yeah. public use facility has taken shape. <laughs> and I just want to get to the last of it, the mud. This is our new construction, the concrete came right to the top. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So the mud is a real problem and we're still fighting it. And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs>